back to the classroom. Then the, the question that I, I've sort of been so inspired by my studies of new media and seeing these types of things come around, I started thinking about what it means for the classroom and what can we bring from these, like what, what's the best stuff that we can bring from new media and the things that we see in, in new media to the classroom. And this is the point where I should tell you that everything changes because you see all the disruption, you see how YouTube disrupts everything, you see how new media disrupts everything. But we need to be a little bit calm about this. This is a quote here um, that maybe will capture this. It says, the inventor of the system deserves to be ranked among the best contributors to learning and science, if not among the greatest benefactors of mankind. This is actually uh, Josiah F. Bumstead in 1841. And he's talking about the benefits of the chalkboard. <laughs> Um, so we see a lot of hype about the web, you know, and it's good to be sort of tempered about that. Uh, there's another one. Books will soon be obsolete in schools. Our school's system will be completely changed in the next 10 years. And this is Thomas Edison, 1913, on the benefits of the motion picture. And he was actually making the argument we still hear today, which is that video recorded lectures will displace the classroom. And that just, this is not happening. Um, here's another one. All this will bring about a profound change in education. We will stop training individuals to be teachers. The problems teachers address are going out the historical window forever in the next decade. And this was uh, Buckminster Fuller, eight, 1962. And he was talking about the two-way TV, which was a really genius thing to think about in 1962 because basically what he was imagining was the internet. He imagined that your TV could actually transmit a signal as well as receive one. So why not let your TV transmit a signal which ask for a specific program at a specific time and then you would get that very specific program at that time. It's very much like the internet and he thought this type of technology would basically do away with um, with education as we know it. He basically thought you would have the most the best expert in anything just produce a documentary and that would become the the uh, authoritative source and people would call for it through the TV but that hasn't been the case. And, we, and what we find today is that teaching still has not changed, and that's probably a good thing in some cases. There's a lot of things we want to hang on to, but learning has. And the, and the thing I want to say about this is that what I'm talking about here is the informal learning that's sort of is happening outside the classroom. And if you think about students learning what they do, and you think about where they're learning, even the most basic materials, like things like reading and writing and so on, we did a series of surveys with our students to find out where they're learning to do these very basic things. And here's what we found out. We found out that they're going to read about eight books this year. Most of them are required. Um, they'll also read 2,300 web pages and 1,281 Facebook profiles. We found that they would write 42 pages for class this semester, groan about most of it. But in the meantime, they'll write over 500 pages of email. They'll spend about three and a half hours a day online, one and a half hours watching TV, two and a half hours listening to music, two hours on the cell phone, three hours in class, seven hours getting about seven hours of sleep, and it comes out to about 26 and a half hours a day, um, which we know is true because they're multitasking or they have hyperattention, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, and they have to. And so Marshall McLuhan made this comment over 40 years ago now that still seems to ring true today, and that is that today's child is bewildered when he enters the 19th century environment that still characterizes the educational establishment, where information is scarce but ordered and structured by fragmented classified patterns, subjects, and schedules. And this led me to think about McLuhan's most famous line, which is the medium is the message, and thinking about then what are students learning in our classrooms, thinking about this informal learning, and what is the culture of the classroom, sort of how is that shaping their, their learning and so on. So again, it's just a simple question. If students learn what they do, what are they learning sitting here? And it's a really powerful question to ask yourself when you're designing your course. It's not just about the content you're delivering, but what are they actually doing? And then, and then what kind of learning are they doing by doing those things? And so we'll start then, uh, we did a real simple thing uh, with my students. We just like brainstormed the types of learning that were happening or what they were doing while they were you know, watching a lecture that was uh, based on a chalkboard, based in PowerPoint and so on. I'll show you some of the results of this. This is our little chalkboard exercise. Um, so I just wrote up on the board, see if you can see this, writing on a chalkboard. And then we started brainstorming. First thing we thought about, well, what's missing? Students immediately grabbed onto like, well, what's missing? Well, there's no photos, you know, like on a PowerPoint. There's no videos, there's no animations. There's no networks, so you can't access the web and so on. And then uh, we started brainstorming different points about writing on a chalkboard. That it forces the teacher to move, which they really liked. 
um, <laughs> that in, in the way you mentioned that, well, it encourages the teacher to move because you can Im imagine that it, a, a teacher wouldn't necessarily move around. Uh, you saw the one to teach to uh, uh, to think on the move, as well to slow down. Like the students noticed how long it took me to write these things. They thought this is great because I tend to be like a real fast talker, you know. So they thought this is great. Um, it encourages the teacher to improvise because it's not all pre-scripted like a PowerPoint. It encourages the teacher to interact. And then this is one of the interesting points. One of the students in the back said they couldn't read it. And we realized, well, it limits class sizes to those who can see the board. So there actually is a technological limitation there. So then we lowered the screen and we go into PowerPoint. So here I'll show you what we did with PowerPoint in our brainstorming. Um, again, we just designed a PowerPoint lesson in class together to think about what PowerPoint was doing uh, and how it was shaping the learning experience. And we found that PowerPoint is different in that it's, it's easy, especially for the professor. You just boom, 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 you click through it. It's kind of mindless and fast and linear. Um, we uh, found a nice way of summarizing this in that it helps the presenter <laughs> remember their notes as you sort of read off of it, um, while often doing great harm to the presentation. <laughs> And then we, this is where the real crux of it, though, is what does it encourage students to do, right? So what are the students doing in, in a PowerPoint lecture, a traditional PowerPoint lecture? And isn't it so weird that we can say traditional PowerPoint lecture? <laughs> when, and I mean, that's how fast things are changing, that now this is the tradition. Um, well, it helps encourage the students to memorize key points, to let the professor decide which points should be key, and to then regurgitate these key points on exams. And so these are not exactly, it's not exactly high levels of learning being attained here. And so we summarize this by saying it's great for teachers, uh, bad for learners. And if you're thinking about the shift that Randy mentioned from teaching to learning, it seems that PowerPoint used badly uh, can really emphasize teaching and not the learning. And that can be really dangerous. Not that PowerPoint can't be used effectively. Um, here's this great quote from Edward Tufton. <laughs> so, and then this is where it, things got really fun in this class, and that's when we started looking at the classroom itself. So thinking about if these started with this little prompt, if these walls could talk, what would they say? And particularly, what would they say about teaching and learning? And so we started brainstorming these questions in class, and this is what we came up with. The first thing is that these walls say that to learn is to acquire information. Like that seems to be what this room is designed for. It's designed for somebody with information to come to the front of the room and to dump that information on others. Secondly, there's a certain implication that information is scarce, and that's why you have to come to this sort of mecca of learning uh, of information so that this person can dump this information on you. The third thing then is to trust authority for good information because the sage on the stage, the authority is the one with that information and you should trust them for this good information. The fourth thing then is that authorized information is beyond discussion. At least, you know, in, in this classroom, the, the, the chairs don't even turn to face each other. It's stadium seating much like this. It's really designed as an information dump. It's, a, it's like a state-of-the-art information dump. It's not about discussing. And so ultimately, it's sort of saying, obey the authority, follow along. That's the implicit message of the walls and the room itself. Not that you can't subvert that. Uh, and it's not, not that it's not even a wonderful place to subvert it, but that's kind of the, the implicit message. And what's worse about this, and this is where my, my own teaching took a radical shift, and that is when I started listening to what students were saying inside these walls, not what the walls were saying, but what the students were saying, in particular the questions they were asking. Because I was thinking about learning, like the best learning starts with a good question. I was thinking about my own learning and how big questions drove my learning all along. And I started listening to the questions students were asking, and they were questions like this. How many points is this worth? How long does this paper need to be? What do we need to know for this test? These are all questions that can be translated as, like, how much do I need to learn? Which is such a weird question, right? Like, this is a place that we've designed for learning, and now you're asking me to tell you how much you need to learn, like, so that you could put a limit on it. And this, again, comes back to this crisis that I mentioned earlier, this crisis of significance, where they don't get it's like students have, have gotten bought into the game of the grades and the, and the getting by and that kind of thing and not the learning itself.